This is Natalie Sweet at the Abraham Lincoln Library and Museum in Harrogate, Tennessee. This is Jake Wynn. I'm with the National Museum of Civil War Medicine and the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum in Washington, D.C. And this is Civil War Connect, an ongoing conversation between our two organizations about medicine during the Civil War and also its connections to the COVID-19 pandemic during the present day. Now, in our news cycle, <clears throat> recently we've been uh, learning a lot about the disease and we've also been seeing how it's disproportionately affected minority communities within the United States such as the African-American community, the Navajo community and today we decided we'd begin to look deeper into uh, We've been, we've been chunking it up into different parts. We've been kind of, we looked at big picture of Civil War mess and now we're going in and looking at more uh, insular topics. So today we're gonna to be talking about African-Americans during the Civil War and uh, their experiences with medicine. So are we ready to start, Jake? Already, All right. let's do this. All right, so, uh, one thing that I know that uh, comes up with our museum a lot is that there's a lot of, we actually do receive a lot of questions about the type of medical care uh, that people who were enslaved received during the Civil War and even prior to the Civil War uh, at plantations. So how much do we know about uh, the type of medical care that was available to enslaved persons and did slave owners provide any medical care or were they more or less on their own when it came to their health? Yeah, it's a, it's a real, it's a real mix. Um, you know, this isn't something we get too much into at the, at the museum yet. Um, this is a topic that I'm, I'm really curious of and really keen to, to make a focus of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine moving forward because we talk about African-American soldiers during the war, and we talk about refugee populations, um, but in order to fully understand that story, you kind of need to know where health is before the war, um, especially in those enslaved communities in the South. Um, from what I've seen, it's kind of a mix. Um, it really depends on um, where uh, those populations are located, um, who is overseeing uh, the properties, the plantations that, that those individuals are on, um, are, are, are located at. Um, you see um, some places uh, where, you know, there is more attention given, um, but oftentimes that only comes down to things like um, things like childbirth um, because of the conditions in slavery and, and kind of, you know, it, it's, it's even difficult to talk about this, but, you know, people being viewed as property um, and the money involved in that um, was just so immense and, and that each child being born into those systems was so, I mean, again, it's hard, it's valuable um, in that system. Um, and so that's where you do see some care being given. As for day-to-day -day health, I mean, this is why um, there's, you know, so much kind of folk medicine um, in communities um, in the South um, is because in many cases they were kind of left to their own devices and left to kind of figure things out. And so that's going to be like a whole other cultural thing. Um, but another kind of really sad, depressing topic um, to touch on is uh, experimentation. Um, and this is something that has gotten um, a lot of press recently um, related to uh, some monuments dedicated to, to some of these medical professionals um, in the mid 19th century who um, did, you know, uh, made, moved medicine forward, um, thinking in things like obstetrics, um, but they did so utilizing enslaved populations without consent. Um, and so there is experimentation going on um, in the South on enslaved people. Uh, and it, again, it's a difficult topic to talk about, um, but it's one that's important and we need to recognize that it was going on. Um, and we need to understand that um, it continued to go on um, when slavery ended um, right at well into the 20th century. Um, so as, as you mentioned at the top, Natalie, um, about this, you know, going up to the present day and talking about relevance, um, this is why this is important because as we're talking about doing experimental medicine, uh, vaccines again for COVID-19 and understanding that some of these minority populations are being uh, impacted at far greater rates 
um, that you know this is this is kind of dangerous waters, and we need to we need to be aware of the past um, because there is a connection, um, unfortunately, to our present. So there's definitely some warnings we need to heed. Yeah, I, it, it particularly makes me think back looking at the the literature that's available on uh, the care of uh, enslaved persons during the civil or prior to the civil war in the antebellum period. Uh, we see myths, for example, uh, that even though, unfortunately, because of the nature of enslavement, uh, a born child was viewed as property and there was value in making certain that the child was born, there are uh, pernicious myths related to mother's health as well that, uh, for example, that black women uh, just more easily gave birth and they didn't need the same level of attending care at birth as, for example, a white woman might need when she was giving birth because they were they were just made to do that. There was a belief in that. And also um, pernicious myths too about tolerance levels of pain and even the ability to become sick that uh, even as they were being viewed and characterized as less, that their bodies were also still somehow superhuman in being able to fight off uh, certain diseases, uh, go through uh, certain trials, uh, being able to work uh, and press to work uh, certain amounts that, the, oh, you just couldn't do that with uh, the white population. And I think that might be something too, um, and it's definitely come up in the literature that's coming more today, of how those myths from the time of the antebellum period have continued on to the present to the point that it even sometimes affects uh, medical medical diagnosis is being made today because those myths have continued on from this time period of enslavement to the present. Right. I mean, that's that's something that, you know, when we get into talking, and I know we're going to do that in just a bit here about the soldier experience um, for United States colored troops during the war, uh, this is going to be directly related. Um, some of those myths are going to be directly related to higher death tolls amongst Black Union soldiers because of disease. Um, and and I, I know we're going to get into that in just a second, but, you know, it's, it's important to recognize um, you know, some of these biases that are baked in um, to, to medical care. Um, and this is something that needs to be addressed today um, that has those, again, those roots and those connections back to the 19th century and even earlier. Oh, well, since, you know, we're, we're on that path of discussion, uh, what were the differences in the quality of medical care that uh, Black Union soldiers received compared to that of White Union soldiers? For, for example, we know uh, that Black Union soldiers received unequal treatment. So in our collection, we have uh, the papers of Benjamin Trail, and he writes home to his brothers. He was, uh, he had received the highest rank he could receive without being uh, receiving an officer commission of sergeant major and uh, he noted that he had to really act as a liaison between the men and his white officers and he received that position because he was a teacher within his community and he was uh, respected for being that role of an educator but he noted uh, you know things like there were not equal rates of pay and treatment and at times uh, the soldiers in his unit, you know, they refused to take pay for a period of time and he felt he had to do the same. So if they're not uh, receiving equal rates of pay, are they receiving equal rates of medical care? Yeah, yeah. This, is, this is what, you know, it, it is interesting um, and it really runs, you know, there's, there's some differences here that I want to get into. So when it comes to surgical care and when it comes to battle wounds, as far as we can tell, and we've been putting, a, the, the National Museum of Civil War Medicine has been putting some energy into kind of looking into this. I have a colleague, Kyle Dalton, um, who's very interested in um, African Americans and connections to the Ambulance Corps um, during the war in, in the U.S. Army, um, and looking at, at black stretcher bearers and ambulance drivers and their experiences. Um, by and large, what we can tell is that once a, a black soldier was taken to a field hospital, um, Again, this is Union Field Hospitals. Um, by and large, the care that they received was on a par 
equal to white Union soldiers. So when it comes to emergency medicine, by and large, the treatment, the experiences are going to be pretty similar. Um, it's when you get into disease um, that things get things get difficult, things get weird. Um, and that comes down to kind of those, those baked in ideas, those ideologies about African Americans and their susceptibility to specifically what are viewed as tropical diseases. So thinking malaria, thinking yellow fever, um, even smallpox. Um, there is this, this kind of baked in idea in American medicine in the 19th century that, um, African Americans were less likely to get the disease, were less likely to die from the disease. Um, and so that resulted in many of these black units when they start to be formed in 1863 after the Emancipation Proclamation. Oftentimes those units were put into tropical areas, swampy areas. They're gonna be the ones that are gonna be detailed along um, in, in swampier areas along the coast and in the interior. And this is gonna translate into higher death rates um, of diseases like malaria, yellow fever, um, because, you know, those biases, those ideas about African Americans and their susceptibility to disease, um, you know, was not based in reality. It was, it was all this kind of, the, again, this bias against them and this idea that they were, um, because, you know, it, connecting it back to Africa, um, but also that there are generations in many cases that are here in the United States or are living in coastal areas doing rice production in South Carolina, um, sugar production in Louisiana. Um, there's this, you know, this idea that, that they are less susceptible to those diseases, which is not true. Um, and that is going to result in higher, significantly higher death rates amongst black Union soldiers um, dying of disease as opposed to uh, their white comrades. Yeah, I, I, and you know, I wonder to, one thing I have a question about as well, we're going to talk about if uh, there were black practicing surgeons, but were there uh, black nurses as well? Because one thing we've talked about in previous weeks is uh, the role and the importance of these nurses and happy uh, Nurses Appreciation Day. That's when uh, we are recording right now. So thank you all. Um, one thing we've talked about on our previous unit on nurses is uh, the importance of their role in taking care and they were often assigned to states and I'm wondering if uh, because of the nature of racism and gender roles were black women uh, welcome or encouraged or were they were they viewed as being the appropriate nurses or were they allowed access to caring for black soldiers and that very important role that we've seen these white women feeling for uh, white soldiers yeah, no, I mean, you're going to see many, many um, black nurses during the war. Um, some, some more famous examples. I, I've been focusing on, um, uh, I have a blog post coming out for the museum. I gave a presentation in the past. I'm going to be giving it virtually um, next month for the museum in June. Um, and that's on the, uh, the USS Red Rover, which is the first hospital ship. Um, for the U.S. Navy. Um, it was plying the waters of the, uh, of the Mississippi and its tributaries during the war, um, and they had a group of black nurses on board. Um, they're actually going to be some of the first African-American women to serve in the U.S. Navy, um, and they're going to be providing nursing care on the ship um, they're going to be working alongside uh, black nurses as well as white medical personnel as well, um, caring for white and black uh, Union soldiers and sailors. Um, and that is, you know, a, an example that is seen in, in many hospitals, um, you know, across the, uh, across the war zone um, that you're going to see uh, black nurses. They're going to be working there um, right alongside, you know, white nurses. Um, that's going to lead to some tension and there's some great um there's some some great literature out there on kind of nurses and um highly recommend you know checking some of those books out um but i think yeah i think you touched on this this is a, an interesting topic and one that um you know i i think all oftentimes you see um the uh then we're going to talk about them in a second african-american doctors kind of take up a lot of the they suck up a lot of the attention and we see less focused on uh, on some of the uh, the African American nurses, um, and in some cases they haven't gotten their due. I think I think that that's going to be an area of, of future kind of scholarship and study. 
You know, I think that's an important point. Uh, like we know, for example, of I, I read a lot of children's books to children about the Civil War, and uh, we read a lot of books about Harriet Tubman because, unfortunately, fortunately and unfortunately, uh, she's one of the few African American women that you can readily teach to younger children because there are books on her life. But uh, it's often mentioned her nursing role or brief nursing role that she had during the war but it's kind of glossed over because i mean and i think you know rightly so her role is uh going down into the south and doing these uh daring rescue missions and also and her uh role in uh leading guiding u.s army troops on, on a mission down the south that's that is the that's an important role and it's the exciting part, but it, it does gloss over her nursing role. I know that at our museum, uh, we offer children uh, opportunities to look at the Civil War through the eyes of children who lived in that war and or uh, teenagers who lived in that war. And one of the women that we actually uh, focus on is Susie King Taylor. Uh, who was an African-American nurse, but she was born in 1848, so she was quite young during the Civil War, but she actually wrote a memoir about her time uh, with uh, the 33rd United States Colored Troop. It's called My Life in Camp with the 33rd United States Colored Troops, and, and she talks about the nursing care that she gave uh, and her role in caring for uh, african-american soldiers during the war and it would be wonderful to be able to see more accounts such as her role and what her experiences were like during the war yeah she she's definitely one that i was gonna bring up um we have a blog post on our clara barton missing soldiers office um website about her um written by um you know a, a great young scholar annika jensen um and uh, yeah, yeah, she she is just that memoir is, is great. If you have not read it, you can find it. Um, you can purchase it if you want an actual book, but it's also available for free online. Um, and I highly recommend reading it. It is uh, it's an excellent account and kind of gives you uh, some insights into. Um, I think she is a good kind of representation, um, even though she's exceptional in that she was able to read and write, um, and also. Um, was you know documented her her experience um but i think her experience um is pretty illustrative of other black women in the south um who come into contact with union soldiers who are going to kind of fit into that role they're going to find employment whether it's as a nurse um, or more likely doing washing cooking kind of some of those domestic tasks associated with um those armies um that Susie King Taylor does frequently, um, as more often in many cases than she is actually nursing. Um, she's a good, she's a good kind of representation of that experience. Yeah, and the one thing our visitors note, uh, her story that the kids can pick is often the one that we get the most commentary on from our visitors, because I think in like Tad Lincoln, who they understand as being that, uh, that voice and eyes within the White House, or even Johnny Clem, who was a young man who ended up uh, being a soldier during the Civil War. Uh, the thing about uh, Susie King Taylor is that they really didn't realize that Black women had been able to serve as nurses and did serve as nurses during the Civil War. So that's definitely an area I think that we need a lot more scholarship and work on uh, within the field of Civil War history, which, it, you know, it seems like we couldn't keep possibly writing about this conflict and have something new to say, but most definitely there are areas that have not been explored enough. And another area that's not been explored enough, but has been slightly explored more than the role of African-American women serving as nurses are the role of African-American physicians who work at the time of the Civil War. So can you tell us some more about them? Yeah, so we have a we have a uh, researcher um, a docent at our museum, um, Dr. Robert Slauson, who um, wrote a small book about um, some of the physicians. I believe he identified thirteen. Um, that number is up for contention um, because um, some of them served in an acting capacity, not in an official um, capacity for the U.S. Army during the war. Um, but yeah, there's I've seen numbers ranging from nine to thirteen. Um, surgeons who served, uh, black surgeons who served in the U.S. Army in some capacity during the war. Um, 
I like to focus on one. Um, he's one of my heroes um, of the Civil War, not just, um, you know, of the Black surgeons or of African Americans in the war. He is, he is, I think, number two on my list of, of um, Civil War heroes, and that is Alexander T. Augusta. Um, he is one of these, uh, one of these African American surgeons. Um, he actually works in a hospital that is uh, a few blocks from where I live um, here in Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, he struggles uh, to get a medical education, um, cannot get it in the United States. Um, ultimately, uh, that was representative um, in the early 19th century. Uh, most of those, uh, again, 9 to 13, um, struggled to find uh, medical education in the United States. A handful of them were able to. Um, others did it abroad, um, where there was less of racism kick, uh, baked into the educational system. Um, but Augusta ends up as the surgeon in charge of um, what became known as Camp Barker here in Washington, D.C., the hospital for that camp, which um, was at, at some points a camp for, for Union soldiers, um, but becomes D.C.'s largest refugee camp. Um, some 20 to 30,000 people um, are going to occupy that camp, which is located about, I'd say it's about a mile, a little less than a mile from downtown D.C. Um, today. Um, but he is going to take over charge of that hospital, I believe in 1863 or 1864, it becomes known as Contraband Hospital. Um, after the war is over, it becomes Freedman's Hospital, um, which becomes Howard University's hospital um, today. And, uh, and Alexander Augusta was actually one of the founding um, teachers, one of the founders of Howard University's medical school in 1867. Um, so there's a fantastic photo of, of the, the, the doctors who started the medical school, and he's, you can see him sitting right, sitting right there. Um, an important kind of civil rights icon alongside being a Civil War surgeon. Um, and, you know, he's buried at Arlington National Cemetery as well. Um, he, like I said, he's one of my Civil War heroes. I put him up on a pedestal because of the challenge he faced, challenges he faced during the war throughout his life, really, um, and what he was able to accomplish. And those other surgeons, they made similar accomplishments and had to overcome similar challenges. So each of them, I mean, each of them is a study in, in you know, fortitude, uh, study in courage, um, and ultimately overcoming those challenges. Yeah, it's um, interesting to consider that they were even able to fight to find a way to be able to attain a, a medical education. And, and something else uh, to consider about this is uh, one thing that we take a close look at our museum is we have been looking at the role, and this is a personal passion of mine, of looking at the people who lived and worked in the Lincoln White House and their associations with the president, but also the ways in which they influenced the president. And one of the people who were very close uh, to Lincoln in his day-to-day -day life was William Slade, who was his usher, uh, also sometimes described as uh, his valet. Those terms sometimes got interchanged in some of the accounts of his life. Uh, and one of the pieces that I had written for the Journal of the Abraham Lincoln Association was, you may have been exposed to Slade in looking at the movie Lincoln. Mm -hmm. he, he appears, he's the gentleman who's constantly trying to... Uh, Put on those Abraham gloves! Lincoln. Those dang gloves! Put on the gloves! Where are the gloves? I know. Which is a thing, but that's a story for another day, uh, for something that makes Nicolay, his secretary, very upset. More so than it does William Slade. Uh, but uh, it's, it's kind of a comical moment. It is personalized. I know uh, that Spielberg took great care in looking up the accounts of the individuals who worked within the White House. And they relied heavily on uh, Washington's book, They Knew Lincoln, which tells the story of African Americans who knew Abraham Lincoln was in Washington, D.C. And Slade is someone uh, that is certainly looked at closely because the author knew Slade's daughter. Uh, but one thing that isn't really gone into as much within that book, uh, but it becomes very clear if you begin looking in uh, 
records such as newspapers, the Washington DC Evening Star, is that Slade was really a leader within the African American community within Washington DC, pushing not only for the idea of slavery ending within the United States, but that, you know, once slavery ended, that African Americans would be afforded the rights of citizenry, particularly the right to vote. And uh, he was a huge proponent of this. He knew Frederick Douglass. In fact, we in the Frederick Douglass papers, we can look around uh, where he writes Douglass and they know each other. And, you know, there are times when he offers, uh, you know, if you need a word with President Johnson, this is after Lincoln's death, you know, I, I can make that happen. So there is an influencer uh, within the White House. But one thing he is incredibly uh, focused on and which uh, we see Abraham Lincoln actually being influenced in by as well, as time goes on, is the service of African-American soldiers by the, the one of the last speeches Lincoln gives is that he says he believes. You know, he's gone from through this process. He evolves as a president. At first, he believes that, you know, uh, colonization needs to occur because he doesn't think, uh, he doesn't think white people and black people can live together peacefully. But that changes over time. And Slate is one of the proponents. He's lived as a free man in Washington, D.C. all his life. He does not want to be colonized. <laughs> uh, he doesn't want to be a part of a colonization project. Uh, that they're pushing for, you know, these rights as citizens. And Lincoln comes to the conclusion and says within his last speech, he thinks, you know, the soldiers who fought during the Civil War should be given the right to vote. And that's been argued as one of the reasons that when John Wilkes Booth hears him say that in the speech, that's one of the reasons why he assassinates the president eventually. But that idea of being uh, an example to the larger community, uh, surgeons like this are, I think, kind of operating with the same idea that Slade has too, that if they can prove themselves, uh, they can't be ignored, the contributions that they can make to society. Uh, were they allowed to treat both uh, white and black patients? Um, there is record that, yes, they're, they're in some cases um, going to be, be treating white men that are going to come under their care. Um, I will admit that I'm not as well versed with the, uh, the, the kind of intricacies of that. Um, by and large, they're going to be treating black men from black units um, and also um, refugee populations as well. Um, Augusta is a good example. Um, of that, um, of coming into contact with, uh, with, with black refugees um, who have, um, you know, chosen freedom with their feet um, and gone to, uh, to union lines to pick up and leave. And uh, they, they left in droves um, and, and headed for the protection of federal territory. Yeah. And uh, a gentleman like Augusta will be shining lots within Washington, D.C., has connections to the Slade family as well. Uh, actually also has a connection. So we're located at Lincoln Memorial University. Uh, both Howard University and Lincoln Memorial University are founded by O.O. Howard. So we yep. have a connection there as well. So that's, a, that's an interesting point. But you note that uh, I guess this is also treating individuals who are part of contraband camps. And now contraband camps, these are individuals who, after uh, Lincoln's uh, military order, the issue of the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, they are now counted as contraband. They previously been designated as property of uh, Southern uh, plantation or sometimes not even plantation owners, just uh, people who enslaved others and they have, been crossing over into the north and their bid to find a place to live following uh, the events that are taking place in the civil war and they're establishing in camps uh, so one of the things that's written about a lot at that time period is there's a there is suspicion among the wild population in areas like dc that these refugees are just bringing masses of disease and that's in addition to taking jobs, they're bringing disease, huge amounts of disease with them. What is really the true story behind that? 
Yeah, this is this is a, a complicated a complicated uh, question, a complicated situation to talk about. I do want to go back kind of to the beginning on this and 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 explore just the origins of that contraband um, name. Um, and this is by and large contraband is going to be how black refugees uh, from slavery seeking shelter in federal lines. It's going to be how they're referred to for for the remainder of the war, and then the the term changes to freedmen um, as the as the war is drawing to a close um, and the term comes from 1861 a month after the battle the, the war has started um, the ben butler benjamin butler is a general um, in the uh, in the union army um, he's down in fortress monroe virginia with three um, enslaved men uh, come into union lines at fortress monroe they had been tasked by their overseers um, by, by slave owners in the Confederate Army with digging fortifications for, for the Confederate forces near Fortress Monroe. Um, Butler brings them in, makes a fateful decision that is going to shape everything um, that will come after it in terms of relationships between African American communities and the federal government during the war. And he is going to refer to them as contraband of war, meaning that the Southerners view these three men as property. They are using that property to, uh, you know, to carry out their rebellion. And so um, Benjamin Butler, as a commander um, in the U.S. Army, he has a right to take away that property. Um, and so that's where the term contraband um, comes from. And it sticks and it's going to be used throughout this, um, this conflict. Um, it does, it, it is used during the war, um, in some cases a derogatory term um, for these refugee communities who um, by the hundreds of thousands are going to leave um, the South and head for federal protection, um, head for, for, for union lines. Many of them are gonna turn into, uh, are gonna become soldiers um, after the Emancipation Proclamation in 63. Um, but because there are so many people traveling, there's so many people um, coming out of uh, leaving these areas, plantations, like you mentioned, but also um, in the very uh, kind of diverse ways that slaveholding in the South is exhibited, people are leaving and heading for, for Union lines. And in many cases, they're going to be gathered in some geographically specific areas, uh, areas along the Mississippi River that are held by, uh, by Union soldiers, um, areas along the, the coast, um, thinking uh, specifically um, South Carolina, the low country um, in the vicinity south, um, kind of between Savannah um, and, uh, and Charleston as another foothold for Union forces is in uh, the in coast of North Carolina um, as well. Um, and then in the area that I'm in, um, around Washington, D.C., um, Alexandria, Virginia, Harper's Ferry, um, what is now West Virginia. Um, and because people are being there, you know, these, these enslaved communities are leaving and coming into Union lines, um, the federal government doesn't know where to put them. Um, they don't know what to do with all of these people who are coming in. Um, there's lots of different views on... Um, you know, whether or not the federal government should care for these people, um, you know, how are you going to, uh, you know, what are, are they going to get jobs? Are they going to take jobs away from white people? Um, so there's all of this coming into play. Um, but you touched on one of the most important, and that's health. Um, and, and there is a view that these communities were unhealthy because they were. Um, and that is not their fault. It's not the people who lived in these refugee camps, um, places like Camp Barker, um, right up the street from where I'm at now. Um, there's a big refugee camp, a contraband camp on the grounds of Arlington, um, Robert E. Lee's wife's uh, family's home, um, what is now Arlington National Cemetery. Um, there was a large community, um, large camp there. Um, and what happens when you put large groups of people in a confined space with very little access to infrastructure like clean water, um, you know, uh, clothing, healthy food, is you're gonna end up with outbreaks of disease. And that goes on today. You can see this today, um, conflict zones around the world, thinking of Yemen, thinking of Syria. But these areas are still dealing with these same issues, outbreaks of disease um, that, you know, 
in the modern world, it, we thought, you know, think are eradicated. Um, and still today, they're, they're suffering from, from illnesses that were seen widely in the refugee camps of the 19th century. Um, so there was very little infrastructure put to helping these communities, these refugee camps. Um, as the war goes on, there's going to be more effort um, put into uh, focusing on trying to get some, you know, creating a healthy environment. There's a great book on this topic um, by Jim Downs um, called Sick from Freedom, which she talks about this much more eloquently than I can. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm really excited. We are going to bring him on to um, the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. We're doing a video with him on uh, May 11th. Um, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> yep. Um, we're doing an interview with, with uh, Professor Downs. Um, we're going to talk about his book and talk about these topics in more detail. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, those, those uh, camps were vectors of disease because of the conditions that were faced in those camps. Um, there are efforts made to try to clean them up by the end of the war. Um, but, uh, and then after the war is over, federal government is going to create the Freedmen, what becomes known as the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, and that is also going to have a wing that is focused on health. Um, and so that is something that is going to, there's kind of a continuum. You see it, no one cares about it at, at the beginning of the war, but as the issue becomes more and more pressing and more, more people become aware of it, and also the, you know, the overflow of the problem in terms of diseases don't just stay in those camps, they're going to spread out from those camps. Um, there is going to be a view that you need to make those places more healthy. And, and that is, again, not the fault of the people who were there. Um, these are the conditions that are faced in wartime. These are the realities of displaced people. Um, and, and during the Civil War, you see that. Um, it is then the responsibility of, of those making healthcare decisions um, who are going to have to kind of answer the, answer the call to try to make those conditions better. And that is going to pay off for both those in the, those camps and also for the, the larger population as well. So that was yeah. a really long answer. I apologize. It, no, uh, no, I, it is, we probably could have done an entire episode and maybe we should at some point just on focusing on uh, the contraband camps. Uh, yeah, another, another great, another great book on that. I, I do want to say we have another uh, interview with her, um, with a professor that's coming out of with Chandra Manning, um, who wrote a book on um, some of these, these camps um, called uh, Troubled Refuge. And then there's another book um, by I think it's Amy Taylor um, that also covers um, these some of these camps um, and their you know the the what was life like in them and also like their kind of place in American history and, and Civil War history. So this is an area that is getting a lot of scholarship now, which I think is fantastic. Um, <clears throat> this is an area that I think um, if you want to be on the cutting edge of Civil War history, uh, this is one of those areas. Yeah, and. Um you know, too, in a previous episode, we had discussed re relief societies, and we begin to see the rise at this time, too, particularly midway and later in the war of contraband relief societies, and these were largely funded uh, by the African-American community at first, but we also see uh, a big moment, uh, Mary Lincoln, perhaps, uh, rightly in some ways and wrongly in others, has been a, a pretty controversial first lady. Uh, but she actually takes a pretty big uh, political action. I don't think it's always been sufficiently viewed as political enough uh, when there was this controversy about contraband camps. And there was also this kind of feeling of, you know, let them take care of their own. Just don't let it affect us. Uh, Elizabeth Keckley, who was uh, Mary Lincoln's seamstress, had actually risen to the head of the Contraband Relief Society in Washington, D.C., and she petitioned the First Lady, uh, would she please make a donation? Now, she's not just asking the First Lady that to do it because she knows the First Lady can provide the money. Uh, Mary Lincoln immediately writes to Abraham Lincoln and, you know, says, Lizzie Kick Kickley needs uh, $200. Can I please provide $200 to this? That's a political action in and of itself, too, because that is a blessing from the first family saying, you know what? Yeah, we're going to we're going to do our part. We're going to put in this two hundred dollars as well. Uh, and that can therefore encourage others then to take part in the relief effort, too, who might have only seen it as an issue that uh, needed to be dealt with by the African-American community in D.C. 
Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's a it's it's interesting the connections between the relief work during the war, relief organizations during the war, and how that gets translated into the Reconstruction period. Um, I've been documenting this is outside of my museum work. Um, been documenting um, the opening of a Freedmen's School um, by a Freedmen's Relief Association that was founded in my part of Pennsylvania where I grew up. And they sent two teachers to Murfreesboro, Tennessee in, uh, in 1867 and 1868 to teach, um, you know, uh, formerly enslaved, um, I would say black children, but it's also uh, adults um, as well that uh, were very keen, uh, especially young adults, very keen on, on learning. And that came directly out of uh, the wartime relief organization. So in fact, there, there was a relief organization, a ladies relief society or ladies relief association in that area. Uh, and that work translated directly into the Freedmen's Relief Association after the war was over. So there's a direct correlation between, um, that you can find in many cases between some of the wartime relief efforts and then that being translated into caring for um, those in the aftermath of, of the war and the consequences of the war. Yeah. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation today. And I am, listen, I'm really excited to be hearing that you're going to have that May 11th talk to discuss uh, Sick for Freedom because that is a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Uh, and if you're tuning in too, I know I will be watching when you have him uh, come down, to, when Jim Down comes to uh, give his talk because I'm really interested to hear it. We've just barely touched on these topics. I feel like we only really scraped the surface. Uh, but that is it for today's episode. So we will return uh, next week with another conversation on Civil War medicine and its connections to the present. We hope it gave you some food for thought today. So until that time, uh, my name is Natalie Sweet and I'm with the Abraham Lincoln Library Museum in Harrogate, Tennessee. And I'm Jane Wynn. I'm Director of Interpretation for the National Museum of Civil War Medicine in Frederick, Maryland, and the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office here in Washington, D.C. And this has been Civil War Connect. We thank you for joining us. If you have questions, by the way, please put them in uh, where it, whichever social media you're following. Put those in because we want to be able to see your questions and be addressing those in future episodes. So until then, this has been Civil War Connect. Have a great day.